Hey, Newbie Dan here. About five months ago, I bought a SawStop job site table saw. I made sure to shoot video of the unboxing process. Well, I'm ready to unveil that video, along with an in-depth review of the good and a few not so good things I've learned in five months of daily use. So stick around, because this is going to be fun. I'm not sure I can convey just how easy it is to unbox and set up this saw. The instructions are clear and concise, all on one large poster-sized page. This is all there is to it. There's nine steps. Step 1. Pull out the wheels and hardware package. Step 2. Cut open the end of the box. Step 3. Slide the saw out so I can attach the wheels. Step 4. Attach the wheels. Step 5. Stand the saw on its end. Step 6. Attach the handles. Step 7. Attach the elevation handle. This was a particularly hard step, as you can tell. Step 8. Roll the saw out of the box and lay it down. Then tilt the blade to 45 degrees. Step 9. Pull out the pin in the back. This was actually the hardest step because I couldn't figure out which side was considered the back. Yeah, I know, look at the pictures, dummy. Hey look, I got an upgraded insert plate. I have no idea what's upgraded about it, but at least I've got one. That's all there is to it. Unboxing and assembly are done. So let's move on to the stand, which is fantastic. It's good and solid, with high quality wheels that roll very smoothly. But watch how easy it is to open the stand. You step on this pedal and walk backwards. That's it. No effort at all. Once the stand is open, the wheels are still on the ground, and that makes it easy to move it around. Closing the stand is as simple as stepping on the pedal and walking forward. Honestly, it's a real pleasure. Before I forget, here's a picture of the leveling feet. Two wing nuts leave them pretty well secured. Let's get the numbers out of the way. I'll make this quick so we can get onto the good stuff. The top is 22 and a half inches deep. With the extension closed, the width is 31 and a quarter inches. With the fence attached, the maximum cut is 13 and a half inches. With the extension open, the width is 43 inches. With the fence attached, the maximum cut is 25 and a half inches. It's 36 inches tall. The widest part is 48 inches and the deepest part is 25 inches. You can't talk about a saw stop without talking about safety, so let's take a look at the saw stop break in action. I want to give a shout out to Aaron over at the Mr. Fixit channel for being kind enough to let me use a portion of his great video on putting a saw stop to the test. It startles you, but man, it would, it would save a finger, I have no doubt about that. No way! <laughs> <laughs> it's totally awesome how this works, and Aaron shot some great footage. Here's a GIF I got off of Reddit. You can see how the brake gets fired into the teeth, causing the blade to stop instantly. Here's what the brake cartridge and blade look like afterwards, in Aaron's video. Obviously, you end up needing to replace both the cartridge and the blade, costing from $100 to $200 depending on the blade but it's cheaper and less painful than a trip to the ER. Run over to Aaron's Mr. Fixit channel to see the entire video and his other great videos. There's a link in the description below. Thanks again, Aaron. Time to start her up. The power switch turns the electronics on and off. I leave it powered on almost all the time. It's this paddle that actually starts and stops the saw. The paddle is nice and large, making it easy for me to shut off with my knee, and it's in the perfect place for that. This switch is for starting the saw in bypass mode, so the brake won't kick in while you're cutting something like aluminum. If you pull this yellow key out, you can't start it in bypass mode. These two lights tell you all sorts of things. To demonstrate, I'll turn the power off, then pull out the paddle. When I turn the power back on, the lights flash in a pattern. To find out what they mean, I'll grab the manual, which is conveniently stored right here, and look it up. The manual says that the lights can flash fast or slow, and both of these are fast. 
So this says the paddle is out, and all I have to do is push it back in to clear the lights. One of the unexpectedly awesome things about this saw is the crank. Sorry, elevation control, as the manual calls it. First of all, it only takes one revolution of the crank to raise or lower the blade completely. Most of the time, I'm only turning it about a half a revolution. Not only is this nice, it turns into a safety feature, at least for me. After I've pushed the paddle in to stop the blade, I often lower the blade while it's still spinning. That means there's less time for me to accidentally touch the blade. Secondly, it's so smooth, it almost doesn't feel mechanical. To me, it's not like a normal crank, where it feels like you're raising a drawbridge, or like my old Ryobi, which, at the end, wouldn't raise at all. To change the tilt of the blade, you squeeze this back plate against the crank wheel, then just slide everything one way or the other. And check out this tilt adjustment knob. It lets you fine-tune the tilt angle by as much as a degree in either direction, and that makes it easy to hone in on a specific angle. But that's only part of the story. This fine adjustment knob means you no longer have to calibrate the 45 and 90 degree stops unless they get way out of whack. Just move the tilt control to 45 or 90 degrees, stick an angle gauge on the blade, and fine-tune it with this knob. A few seconds and you're spot on. If you've ever had to recalibrate your tilt stops, you can see why this knob is so great. Why can't all saws be like this? By the way, the 45 and 90 degree stops came calibrated pretty close to perfect from the factory. If there's any discrepancy, I just fix it here. The blade raises to a maximum height of about 3 and an eighth inches. Here's the blade that came with the saw, and it's not much to look at. I replaced it right away. This Diablo blade actually improves the dust collection for some reason. Maybe the shape of the teeth? I don't know. The insert plate has five leveling screws. By the way, the dust collection is decent. Even though the bottom of the saw is open, I get very little dust falling onto the floor underneath. It's a snap to remove or install the riving knife. Same with the blade guard if you use it. Here's the arbor wrenches. You can see how big the back arbor nut is. In order to show you some other features, I'm going to replace the blade with a dado stack. Oh darn, I dropped the nut. Don't you just hate that? It's so hard to squeeze your hand down there to get it. Ooh, want to see that again? The dust shroud has two doors that are attached with magnets and easily swing out of the way. Again, why don't all saws work like this? The back one actually needs to swing out of the way so you can remove the brake cartridge. You just turn a pin and out it comes. This is the brake surface, the part that gets jammed into the blade when the brake gets triggered. This plugs into the electronics. Here's the brake for a standard 10 inch blade and a brake for a typical 8 inch dado stack. You have to purchase the dado brake separately for around $90. The dado brake is larger because it has to reach down an extra inch to get close to the 8 inch blade. The brake surface is also larger, so it covers all the blades in the stack. Here's the pin that holds the cartridge in. So let me go ahead and install the dado stack. Actually, it's not really a dado stack. It's a box joint blade set, but let's just call it a dado stack. I actually haven't used it in this saw yet. I put it in once and spun it up just to make sure everything fits, but that's it. I got this second insert plate, and I might as well cut the kerf while I'm here. By the way, this saw is pretty loud. You definitely want hearing protection. Before I forget to mention it, the blade alignment was pretty good, straight from the factory. It was off by a couple thousandths of an inch, but that's not much at all. If you've seen my table saw tune-up videos, then you know how easy it is to adjust. Just turn this machine screw with the included hex key. I got it down to basically perfect. Here's a couple of the problems I've encountered. First, the top scratches too easily. This is actually just a cosmetic thing, because the scratches are hardly noticeable to the touch. Second, the right miter track was pinching a little at the far end. I had to file it a little to fix it. 
but I can tell you that the top itself is pretty darn hard because it took way more effort to file than I thought it would. To open the extension, flip this handle down, move the extension all the way out, and flip the handle back up. The manual says the extension must be either closed or open the entire way. It feels really solid. This is a storage box, and we'll get to it shortly. The fence has a slide out shelf to help hold stock that extends over the gap. It works well, but you have to remember to close it when you're done. I don't think this will be an issue, but time will tell. I can be pretty forgetful, but so far, so good. Knock on Baltic birch plywood. Now we come to the fence, which contains one of the two biggest complaints I have about the job site table saw. But the problem isn't what you would normally think of when it comes to fences. No, it moves smoothly and clamps down good and solid. The end doesn't move too much while cutting. The alignment was decent out of the box, although I did fine tune it, and adjusting the alignment was pretty easy. The position is easy to read. All in all, it's a good fence. Except, when I unlock the fence, it doesn't stay in the same position. This makes it hard to sneak up on a cut. But I should point out that I haven't seen anyone else complain about this, so I wonder if it's just an issue with this specific fence. I called support and they said to adjust the tightness of the fence clamp, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. Still, it's possible there's a way to fix this and I just don't know how. At least I've got a workaround for it that works fairly well. See the description below for links to my workaround. The fence is stored down here. It can be locked into place if needed. Here's another cosmetic complaint I have. It's easy to scratch the top of the fence when putting it in or taking it out. Not the end of the world, but it could have been designed better. There's a push stick here too if you like this kind of push stick. I think Matthias Wandel would approve. Let's jump around to the back for a second. You can store a blade here along with the wrenches. If you take your saw to a job site, this would be useful. Here's the dust port. The dust port is a little larger than any of my other dust ports. It's not too large, at least for this hose, but it's close. Here's what it looks like when I tilt the blade. If I ever have to adjust the 45 and 90 degree tilt stops, they're in here. As I mentioned before, with the tilt fine adjustment knob, I doubt I'll ever need to adjust the stops, but if I do, it might be a tight fit. There's no excuse to include a crappy miter gauge with any saw, but especially not one this expensive. Granted, this is the least expensive saw that SawStop sells. Still, for $1,200, they could damn well afford to include a decent miter gauge. If not, charge a little more to cover the cost, but don't insult me with this piece of crap. Needless to say, I bought a separate miter gauge. Another unexpected feature of the saw stop is this storage box. Conveniently located under the extension, my only wish is that it had room for more stuff in it. The top of the toolbox has instructions for what to do if the brake gets tripped, how to check if your material is conductive, in other words, would it trip the brake, and how to use bypass mode. All of this information is in the manual too. Speaking of which, as I mentioned before, it's got a place for the manual, which is really nice, especially when you've got lights flashing at you trying to tell you something's wrong, which doesn't happen very often, by the way. It's got a place for the miter gauge. Too bad my new miter gauge won't fit in here. Storage for the dado-sized brake, although I'm sure a normal brake would fit in here also. Here's the anti-kickback prowls and the blade guard. Three hex keys, which are needed for various maintenance functions. And last but not least, storage for the optional tape measure. I kid you not, that's what the manual says. Anyway, the storage box is nice, even if it could have been bigger. So how well does it work? As far as cutting is concerned, it works great. But you have to remember that this is a portable saw, and it will bog down some when cutting certain types of stock. So now for the $64,000 question. Am I glad I bought the saw? If you look on Amazon, the reviews are polarized. Some people think the saw is great. Some people are terribly disappointed. I think it mostly depends on your expectations. When I bought this saw, I actually didn't do much research. I needed a new saw, 
and my wife said she'd feel better if I got something safe, especially after my router accident, so I bought the least expensive saw stop. And since I hadn't done much research, I had no expectations other than safety. So when I started unboxing the saw and began to see all the great features, I was in seventh heaven. And first impressions stick with you. When I started noticing things like the top scratching and the fence moving when I unlock it, well, it is what it is. I wish it were different, but it isn't going to change. In spite of that, there's still plenty to like, and the truth is I love using this saw most of the time. So the bottom line is, I'm personally very glad I bought the saw. So now you've heard what I think. I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. Check out the description for links to products seen in this video. Just scroll down, click Show More, and scroll down until you see the links. And if you like what I do here, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to ring that bell to get notified about new videos. Thanks.